colleague from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I can spend a lot of time talking about that, which works, which one, what he's done, and what he wrote for what I think it's better if he speaks. I think most of you know him. Uh, so there is the floor shows. Thank you very much, Moni. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our work. Second, I think it's for, as already mentioned, uh, I'm really a relief that we can be here live, up close, really uh, talking about our science. And that's also for me, after all these Zoom teams and whatever words we have been using for all this uh, online communication, I think it's our time that we meet and discuss things and that is, uh, I think, not only happening uh, in the meeting hall, in this lecture hall, but also, I think, uh, outside. As you can note, I think it's uh, also a beautiful location. This is a picture I took uh, uh, from New York, from Central Park. And somehow it is also what I would like to do because uh, you can see this, the light. The light tries to find something and what we try to find in the tells is the active side, active face that is often obscured, not that clear. And I hope that uh, with my lecture I can shed some light on this. The talk of my, uh, the, the title of my presentation is on activation and deactivation. I will have two parts, and the first part I'll discuss about activation and deactivation, but actually it's about the life of a catalyst. A catalyst you put in a reactor, it comes to life, it is the bird, the bird of the active site, and later on it will actually develop to something that matures and then as always something also ages. So the, 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 the active phase, the active site is an old concept that goes back to uh, well, a professor here in the US, actually uh, Taylor, and Taylor has been defining it as a yes, something that's doing it, a defect, something that is under coordinated, whatever, and since then many, many efforts have been in our field to try to shut this data. Right? Now there are two main schools of thought. They are not uh, contrary to, to each other, actually they are complementary. On one hand, you have the language school of thought, where you have facets, I think that's also where all the model systems come from, and then you have the Taylor's school of thought, where you can actually see that it is starting from a uh, defect, and then transient methods, etc. and how. Now we are in the session of Operando, and um, we had some colleagues actually years ago actually started with a term and it's so uh, yeah, almost remarkable that we have now sessions and other things on this term but the, as already explained this morning by Beatriz very well, Beatriz hold on very well, that is that what we try to do is to bring the spectrometer to the reactor by trying to make no compromise and by making no compromises you will have to give in certain things but also we hopefully can learn something about intelligence. What you want to do is to make structure performance relationships. You want to really dive into the system to learn and make correlations on the structure, the composition, while it's working. Although it sounds simple, it's far from trivial. And I take this as, a for, as an example, a zeolite. A zeolite where we know it's a structure, a crystallographic structure with well-defined t sites previous lecture also alluded to that. But if you want to access this material, you can use advanced methodologies, and I will show you in a minute one of them. And then you can start to detect this active site. But here I show you, in the next slide, single molecule fluorescence. In every, I hope it shows, every flash is a molecule which reacts at a brown acid site it makes a fluorescent molecule, and that is what you see. Now, for those who have been seeing the number of flashes, there was not that much. That means that there are many of these sites seemingly under these conditions of, in this case, room temperature, not active. They are seemingly sleeping. That is something that we also find, for example, in the literature on enzymes. The other thing what I want to show you this is that you need time resolution, and space resolution. And here I show that pictorially. Space means you have to zoom in, zoom out. All length scales of, are, are of importance. And time also means you want to measure fast, but also slow. And you want to do it post to actually perturb the system. We want to do that, and that has already been this
discussed in many of the plenary uh, talks. We want to move into a new society, a society which is circular, more sustainable. That means we will have to develop new catalysts, new processes, new reactors. What I want to do today is to show you the role of operando in situ spectroscopy, microscopy, towards this refinery of the future, or whatever you can call it. And I want to focus on something on the left. It means that I want to cut molecules in pieces, and I want to do something on the right, which are pasting molecules together. And for the pasting, I will use CO2, CO2 hydrogenation. And for the paste, for the, the cutting, I will use plastic biomass and other molecules, which are wasted. So that brings me to the outline of my talk. The first part I want to show catalyst activation. Second part, catalyst deactivation. The first part is on thermal and electrocatalytic conversion of CO2, a topic which is very prominent during this conference. And I will add to this today the comparison between different metals, but also I will want to introduce to you transient spectroscopy, sub-second XOFs, sub-second infrared, sub-second drama. Here I show you a litigious survey. On the left you have actually gas phase, on the right you see electrocatalysis of CO2. I don't want to invite you to read all the details of this plot, but actually it compares the different base and noble metals for doing this reaction. And it's very peculiar to see that with cobalt you can make long chain nickel, mainly methane, for gas phase CO2 zero uh, hydrogenation. But with electrocatalysis, it's actually also funny that you can make CO methane, but also C2 coupling products with copper. Can we find some common grounds? Or can we start to address and make the differences or the similarities between gas phase and liquid phase catalysis? I want to start with the Sabatier reaction, which is nickel CO2 hydrogenation. It's already explained, I think, in several other talks. It is done with nickel-based catalysts, which are metal nanoparticles of different supports. You are put on this, for example, reactor, this one in Germany, where it's a pilot scale reactor where you can find these extra bits. We have been mimicking this by building a setup which uh, is capturing the solar light, the sunlight. The solar panel makes uh, the electricity. Then you have electrolysis making the hydrogen. The hydrogen is combined with CO2, and then you can make all products you want in principle, depending on the catalyst used. I want to focus on a concept which is out already for a while, which is structure sensitivity. That means when you change the metal nanoparticle, you will change the surface. When you change the surface, you will expose different atoms towards the molecule. What about CO2 hydrogenation? What we have done is we have used nickel metal nanoparticles, put it on a silica support, and changing the metal nanoparticle size. And when you do that, then you have the plot on the left, where you see here the turnover frequency, CO2 molecules converted per nickel surface atom per second. You see it goes up and then somehow drops. I want to put here that it's in 0.04 on the left, and 0.004 y-axis on the right, when I show you a structure insensitive reaction, which is the ethane hydrogenation. It's almost flat. So I introduce you the first operando methodology. Quick X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Quick is sub-second. Quick means that you can now start to also make pulses. Pulses of CO2 hydrogen, CO2 hydrogen and see how the system responds. That means you have many spectra, many spectra which have to be analyzed by chemometrical approaches. And you can do then a linear combination of what I would call nickel metal and something which is a nickel oxide or a suboxide. When you do this and you get the pulses which you see on the left, 100 seconds you see hydrogen, nitrogen, CO2, Hydrogen, nitrogen, CO2, you see it's going up and down, up and down. And what is going up 
and down is the contribution of metallic nickel. Now, on the, in the middle part, you see some rough calculations, and you, you don't have to take it too serious, because we don't know exactly how it is there at the surface. But if you start to count, you will see that only a small fraction of the metal nanoparticle responds to this uh, uh, wiggling, which is actually indicating the Taylor ratio, where you say how many of these things are responding relative of the total number of surface atoms. And I want to show you the changes. The changes are rather drastic. On the left, you see the structure sensitive, CO2 hydrogenation. On the right, structure insensitive, ethylene hydrogenation. What you can notice is that you see these wiggles, and the wiggles are more pronounced for a structure insensitive reaction. And that is also not only temperature dependent, but also nanoparticle size dependent. Here I show you two uh, horizontal, um, vertical lines, sorry, vertical lines, total lines, and I want to focus on these uh, vertical lines. If I'm now plotting the delta, the change normalized, as a function of particle size, you see these uh, greenish and reddish bars. And you can note again now, in the scale on the y and the uh, axis for both structure and insensitive, structure sensitive, in a structure insensitive reaction, there's a huge difference between them. It's going not only in the sense that it is happening. For example, here I show you the pulses in the exons, and you can really see the nickel nickel bolt and the nickel nickel actually, the multiple scattering, how it responds. Hydrogen, ethylene, hydrogen, ethylene, and you see that the system, I don't say breathes, but at least responds to the gases. This was the metal nanoparticle, the lot with molecules. So we did CO2 hydrogenation, and we did it in this operando infrared. We did it for all metal nanoparticles. And all these metal nanoparticles, you see here 1.2, 2.1, but also the in-betweens, up to 6. You don't have to be a specialist in infrared to see that there are huge differences. And these huge differences are due to the presence of different intermediates. <coughs> what do we observe? We observe CO2 gas, methane gas, CO gas, CO adsorbed, linear bridge, formate and formal. The molecule for, from CO2 to methane actually follows the blue and the red dots. And I want to point that only the red ones we see at the surface of a very active catalyst. That means that we are now in a position to follow this with infrared, but I did not explain structure sensitivity. So we reached out to our colleagues at Antwerp University, and here Kenneth also have to begin to PG student Alan Starr, the first author of this paper, where we have been making models of these different particles and calculating the forward and backward reaction and activation barrier, as is shown here, for the different facets, 111, 100, 110, and 211. This is too complex, but I want to show you the most likely route according to theory, which is of course occurring at the 110 facet. And here you see on the top the transition state, on the bottom the reaction intermediates. The most interesting is that when you take now all these theoretical results together and you start to compare them, and indeed the 110 is the most reactive one, then I would like to turn to the right plot, which is a rather complex but important one. If you only take the 110, then you have a hockey stick activity plot, which you are most probably also familiar with because people have also seen it, for example, in fish atrophy. If you start now, so it does not explain our observation of this peak around 2-3 nanometer particles. But there are next to the facets, there are also these under-coordinated sites. And assume we would give them an activity which is equal to the 110, 
then you can make that peak. If you give them different activity plots, then it actually drops and becomes something like a hockey stick activity plot. It shows that theory does not explain in full this structure sensitivity, and that most probably we have these sites, other coordinated sites, which are also involved in doing the job. I hear a movie actually to summarize this first part. CO2 is captured, hydrogen is made, and guided over these exterates with nickel. Here you see the nickel metal nanoparticles with the different facets. And these different facets have different reactivity and are differently exposed depending on the metal nanoparticle size to a molecule like CO2. CO2 and hydrogen will now start to land on this surface and start to react. And what you notice is actually that then in stepwise, water and methane is formed. Now this shows that you can theoretically and also experimentally approach this. And I want to move to cold. And here I want to make the analogy, of course, with fischer tropsch which is CO with hydrogen. One of the catalysts which is de uh, developed for CO hydrogenation, fischer tropsch is a cobalt titania system. And you can see the company left in the plot, which is actually sponsoring for years already our research in this field. Now, CO can also be together with CO2. And it can be together in, for example, these large units, which in this case, Tata Steel, a steel industry manufacturing plant in the Netherlands. The whole point is that CO and CO2 give a different chemical potential to the environment, hence will also affect the oxidation state. And we are interested in, is it cobalt metal, cobalt oxygen or a combination, and what is CO2, CO doing? I introduce to you the second transient technique, which is overall the modulated excitation infrared spectroscopy. What you can do is you can measure in the time domain, which I showed you already before, but you can translate that to the phase domain. The result is that you filter out noise, and also you can see the species responding to a pulse. What is the pulse we use? The pulse we use is that we have a constant hydrogen and we actually add CO2. CO2 off, all off, as is shown in the middle plot on the right. We have been studying two systems. Cobalt titania is oxidized or mainly oxidized state because you can imagine there is a reducing environment still. And a cobalt titania reduced. And how do we know that? Because we probe it with operando Raman, and we follow if there's still oxide around while the reaction is running. That's the right plot. Now comes the interesting one. It's the drifts modulated excitation results. On the left you see the oxidized, on the right the reduced. On the top is the time domain, that's where you're used to, the time resolved spectrum. And when you do demodulation, then you can see how it translates in the bottom star, a bottom spectrum. And you see it goes in up and down. You see it actually going from this reddish to going to the yellowish, reddish, yellowish. And that is how the system behaves. Now it's clear that on the left oxidized, you see this CO absorbed not really responding very well. Whereas on the right, when it's reduced, you see it really responding. Now you can plot that in a different way, and that is actually a rather difficult plot in the middle on the right, where I show you desorption slope. What is that? It means how fast does it respond? And you can see that for a reduced catalyst, it really responds very fast when it's, for example, the CO is, uh, the CO2 is going off and on. Based on that, and the identification of the different bands as shown in the lab plot, we can follow actually and see that in the cobalt oxide we follow hydrogen assisted, in the, um, uh, uh, the reduced state we have actually a direct dissociation mechanism, which is plotted here in this slide. 
The top is the direct dissociation, the bottom is the CO insertion, and we believe, although I cannot show the data due to time reasons, that also the CO hydrogenation is not fully but mainly following this direct dissociation around. Third thing is electrocatalysis, copper. And I want to introduce you time resolved and pulsed Raman. Now with copper we have an advantage. Raman spectroscopy is not a very sensitive technique, but copper is an enhancer for Raman signals, which we call surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, in short, SERS. This is a cell which we have developed uh, at Utrecht University, and we have been plotting and following this reaction. I start with a pristine on the left copper oxide system, which you can reduce, anodize, and reduce again, which is on the right. When you have the right uh, uh, system, then you can have really um, the signals which you want to follow. For example, here in the uh, middle of the right port, you can see a um, uh, uh, carbonate species which is on the anodized uh, surface mate. This anodization leads to something else. It boosts the formation of ethylene, which is in the bottom right port. So next to CO and methane, you make ethylene. Now what is going on? We have been following that in great detail with this technique, and you can follow different species. We have ramped up the, the potential, actually minus 0 0.7, and then you actually start to see a lot of things. And here I want to compare on the left the pristine, not much to see, and here on the bottom, uh, uh, bottom uh, uh, middle, you can see a lot of changes. Now these can be translated in different CO absorbed species. And by doing this, you can see a high frequency, a low frequency bridged CO. And we have been able, and I will show that in a minute, to try to assign and link them to formation of certain species. The high frequency, we actually uh, ascribe uh, the one which is related to CO formation. The low frequency to ethylene formation. Why I'm saying so? This method, which can go sub-second, can also do um, it during a cyclophotometry plot. So what we did is we changed the time and the potential, and we actually were running four times from A to F, A to F. So what you do is you ramp up from positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and you look what is happening at the surface. And what you do is actually, you will see that you will go through this cycle. And you can see the different species at the surface. What do we see? We see actually a copper oxide, a copper hydroxide. We see carbonate bicarbonate near the surface. We see CO absorbed in its different uh, uh, types. And also I will show you in a minute we see what we call a dynamic CO, whatever that may mean. But before diving into that, I want to show you the results summarized in a movie. Back over, folks. So here you see the movie where we actually dive into this system and we look at the surface when we actually are doing this uh, cyclovoltometry bolt. So you start with the material which has is oxide hydroxide, and what you will make is this copper metal phase. And then it starts to be also very surface active and environment active. And it means you can see the different species carbonate by then take more than grid. You see on the, uh, the screen there on the blue, you see actually the Raman spectra changing during this um, cyclovoltometry plot. And we have do been doing it four times, so we know it's reliable and it is very similar in all these cases, with the exception of the first one. But this is dynamic, but not yet pulsed. So what we did is we did pulsed experimentation. So we did actually first minus 35 or minus 0 0.25, and then for 10 seconds actually we ramped it up. 
by having this anodic pulses versus cathode bias, you can see how the system responds. And surprisingly, we saw that at very low voltage, you make a lot of CO and much more than we expected. And the nice thing is you can do that with this time-resolved Raman. And we observe at that moment what we call dynamic CO. The dynamic CO is seemingly rel related to the increased formation of CO, but also with what we, and I cannot put all the evidence now here on the table, where we see a partial dissolution of the copper into a solution and a precipitate which is called precipitated on this copper surface. And the picture there, you can already see those in the front should be able to see some flakes of material which are formed, which we identify as a malachite type material. Now what is interesting is that you can now start not to do that time resolved pulse, but also microscopy. Raman allows to do microscopy. So what we did is that we compared again pristine and anodized, and we have been following this kind of material, which is shown there in the gray, which is scanning electron microscopy, and on the right middle, you can see the Raman uh, microscopy data. The question is, we see different species. What do they are? Well, we have been using not only CO2-12, but also CO2-13, but also with carbonate-13 to make sure that it is a reliable experiment. And we have been identifying the different peaks. We have identified two different CO's, together with them, two carbon-copper vibrations. And these two are at different positions in the material with different intensities. And if you plot that as function of time, for a pristine and an anodized, remember the pristine has not a lot of ethylene, the one which is anodized has a lot. You can see, and this is the main, mo most important here, you see if the pristine, it's actually boring, oops, boring, not much changing. But here for the anodized, you see that in the beginning you have this 350 peak, and then it actually jumps further. That brings us to an, I don't say mechanism, that's not, I, I think that's too far. But at least we see now surf species which are related. First, we have this 360 copper, which seemingly lead to a 496 copper, which leads to a species where we believe that two coppers, two carbons, coppers are close to each other, which is the precursor for ethylene or ethanol. But there, I have to stop with my uh, 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 my ideas because I don't have further proof to make that already clear to you. Second part is on catalyst deactivation. And catalyst deactivation is, in this case, I will focus on a topic which we have been studying already for years. Cracking molecules in smaller pieces. It's regularly done with crude oil. We actually put here a talk this morning from Chevron that is now shifting towards other uh, intake molecules like biomass, but also plastic, as already yesterday explained by one of our people in our group, in our forum. Catalytic cracking, fluid catalytic cracking is a huge process. Many of the oil refiners have this unit, and it is somehow the grand old lady in zeolite catalysis. And it will show, I think, also in the future, its merits. It's a very complex system. Balls, catalytic balls of about 50 to 100 micrometers containing zeolite, clay, alumina, and silica. As already mentioned, you can use it for several purposes, for biomass, plastic, and so on. But many of you will be also aware that this catalyst is coking, is deactivated. And the question is, can we elucidate the deactivation mechanism of this system? So here I show you what we think is happening. And in the next slides, I would like to prove that it is happening. Some of them is, I think, already proposed in literature. And I hope with my data, of our data, we can show indeed that it is the case. 
But before uh, discussing, coke is something which is almost associated with catalysis already for decades. If you use methanol, if you use propane, if you use any almost organic molecule, then it will lead to some point when there's an acetyl metal around, it will actually have a growing, and here I show you this kind of black hole, where depending on the molecule you start, you build up different aromatic compounds. Many techniques are out. Bulk, atomic scale, a parallel, sub-micrometer, nanometer, whatever. The review will be hopefully published soon, and then you can read more about all this. So what we have been now doing is to try to prove or disprove some of these mechanisms. I want to introduce you the first method which I want to discuss now is transmission X-ray microscopy, a technique which we have been developing together with the beamline scientists at Slack Mango Park here in the USA. With this technique you can focus X-ray down with zone plates in a nanometer scale regime. You can study real-life catalysts as this fluid catalytic cracking part. Orange, yellow is iron, blue, gr uh, green is nickel, and also you can do it because it's non-invasive tomography. You can really look into the system. You can actually determine what is going on in this system. We were very happy actually that we had access to different samples from industry, from oil refineries, where they have been testing it and having different activity. Here I show you the deactivation from fresh, low metal loading LML, medium metal loading MML, and HML, the high metal loading. You can see the pore accessibility is decreasing, but also the catalytic cracking is decreasing. Now, when you start with this kind of research, you're always uh, somehow proud that you can do it. And then you write a review paper, and then you find that there are already people who are doing that much before you. <laughs> and that is also true. Here I show you on the left, and that's the reason why it maybe escaped our attention, because it was in a journal, which at least I'm not regularly reading, where you can see that the resolution in 1991 was about 10 micrometers and 3 micrometers. But since then, we really evolved a lot. And that is shown by this plot 1991, 2014, 2016, and now I want to show you 2021, 2022. For this, I want to go to a synchrotron in Hamburg, DAISY, where we'll be doing whole tomography fluorescence. We have a catalyst particle with coke and without coke. On the top you see, on the top right you see the dark particle with coke, and we actually follow the calcination process of this particle. Here I show you the particle, X-ray tomography, with this metal formation and carbon deposits which you can now see. One particle non-invasive, 3D the coke in pink, the lanthanum is in gold, the lanthanum is associated with zeolite. And then we have nickel in green and iron in orange. Actually, it confirms more or less what we saw already from our slack experiments, but now with much better resolution. And now you can do funny things because you have many data, data many voxels, and you can start to analyze it voxel per voxel for a particle. Here I show you the change by having the cal calcining the system and removing the coke. And here I show you, for example, the change in micropore volume, surface uh, 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 area, and so on. Now the nice thing is that you can also detect where the coke is and what type of coke you have. And here I zoom in on a slice where the yellow thing is the outer coke. The outer coke has also inner coke, that they are these other colors that you can find. And the orange layer is the iron. So the iron shell 
needs to coat deposits which are very extended. And below what you see here on the left are the coats which are associated most probably with the zeolites. We can energetically resolve them. We call them surface coke and core coke, whatever that may them mean. But there's a method which you can actually detect this, and that is NMR. When NMR is used together with this paramagnetic molecule, we call it a dynamic nuclear power polarization. We are very happy that at Utrecht University we have the group of Mark Baldus who has very advanced NMR tools. We actually can confirm that we have aromatic type large molecules at the outer surface near these iron metals, but also we have these aliphatic or smaller coke molecules in. I'm almost there. And I want to introduce to you one technique which is X-ray absorption spectroscopy and X-ray diffraction. The technique which I want to show you is a method where you can follow the zeolite delamination. The zeolite delamination is very interesting because what you can do is you can start on to follow with X-ray diffraction spatial resolve what is happening. We had the luck that we had a nickel and vanadium rich sample and a nickel and vanadium free sample. And by doing and comparing them, the rich one is the top layer, the top set of X-ray diffraction patterns, and the bottom one is the, uh, the, the one which is free of nickel, or almost free of nickel and iron. What you can clearly see is that you have deillumination. Now what we have been doing is, we have been now using this acidity, and we wanted to see if we can actually separate the metal, these, uh, these spherical particles, and analyze them one by one. And here I want to give credits actually to our collaboration with the University of Twente, but also where we have been inspired by life sciences. What we have been developing is a microreactor, which allows to separate catalyst nanoparticles on the basis of that acidity. And how does it work? It works because we use a fluorescent probe. And you remember in the start of my talk, I showed already a fluorescent molecule interacting with the zeolite. So we titrate the acid sites of the zeolite and we give it a color. We make it fluorescent. And by doing this and by having a direct electrophoresis uh, setup where we follow the permittivity changes, we can actually start to sort particles. What we do is, we have a particle with a lot of acidity, not a lot of acidity. And by having a decision-making thing, you can say, separate, not separate, separate, not separate. How does it look? I hope it will. Yep, here is it. Here I show you the movie. Every droplet has one catalyst particle. In the middle, you have the detector. The detector meet, uh, measures the fluorescence. If the fluorescence hits a certain value, the thing is separated. And what you then have is sorted and non sorted particles. And from then, you can start to use your regular, but now single particle analysis tools. And you can start to determine why a certain particle is super active or why a particle really immediately deactivated. And this hopefully will lead to new FCC particles useful to convert biomass, plastic, and so on. The new feedstocks we want to process or co-process in these units. I want to end. I introduce you several methodologies I also hope I convince you that we need data mining, spectral analysis, theoretical chemistry, and also this miniaturization efforts next to our operable tools. Thanks for inviting, but before that, I have to thank my group. Here's a picture when we are all enthusiastically showing that we are enjoying again being together. Thanks for the
time for a few questions?